Thank you all for being here. Hi, I'm Skip Rutherford, and uh, welcome to the Six Bridges Book Festival. I, let's give a round of applause for the Central Arkansas Library System. <laughs> when we walked through, Chris just said, uh, gosh, this auditorium is great. And I said, you're right, and we're so proud to have it. <laughs> so let me introduce uh, my friend, who is um, one of the best political commentators uh, that I have ever known and certainly followed, Chris Eliza has four decades of covering politics. Makes me feel old. He, he, <laughs> he's, he's worked in a variety of different organizations, including the Washington Post and CNN, uh, but he uh, when I have taught election courses, Chris is one of the people that I follow. And I, I must tell you that last night during the Republican debate, and I must confess that I channel surfed, uh, <laughs> but I was following Chris on Twitter to see what his comments were to see if he agreed with me or more or less I agreed with him. But so, Chris, we're glad to have you. Welcome to Little Rock. Thank you all. Um, thank you so much. I had a, um, so I, I agreed to this because Skip asked me to months and months and months ago. And I, you know, like many things that you agree to, you just like put down the date on your calendar and you're like, <laughs> surely that day will never come and there will never be anything on my calendar that I have to do other than that. So as I got closer, I was like, why does September 27th ring a bell for me? Like I couldn't, couldn't place it. And I was like, wait a minute. I was like, is it a Wednesday? Yep. Is it a debate that night? Yep. So then I did the like quick Google, made sure Little Rock was in the central time zone. So I figured out like when my flight landed versus when the debate started. And thanks to Suzanne, I made it uh, 30 minutes early, had a chance to eat all my special treats that y'all got me. Uh, and watch, I mean, you could say this is a good or a bad thing, watch the whole debate. So it's been wonderful. I didn't realize, I told Skip on the walk down here, it's 65 degrees in Washington. I did not realize it was still 95 degrees here. <laughs> I did not look, I was like, surely it'll be hotter, but it won't be that hot. But I miscalculated that. So I don't have the appropriate clothes on, but it's wonderful to be here. No, I, and we're, we're, we appreciate you making the effort to be here. Uh, when this book came out, I, I bought it immediately uh, because uh, I love the, obviously the subject of politics and I love the subject of sports and Chris has captured it plus uh, disclosure is good for the soul he did call me and want some Clinton stories and I, I, I said Chris okay but I'm I don't want to get myself in trouble here but 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 they're fine I read it and I'm good and everybody's cleared off on it but anyway Chris uh, how'd you write what 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 was the impetus of this book so I, I think a lot of people will tell you, and, you know, David Graham may tell you afterward that, you know, he had this, you know, brilliant idea and, and it came out of nowhere. For, for me, it was like mostly selfish. Uh, I care a lot about politics, obviously. And growing up, I always thought I would be a sports reporter. Uh, so they the publishing house came to me and said, we'd like you to write a book, which... <laughs> It's like very flattering and nice. I mean, you know, not, it's not a bad thing. But I was like, what about? Um, and they didn't have any ideas. And I said, well, you know, I guess I'll get back to you later on that. And as I was thinking about it, I selfishly thought, if I'm going to write a book, and this is going to take a significant amount of my time, I want to do it on something I'm passionate about, right? Like, I don't want to spend every weekend, nights, because at that time I was working full time, I didn't want to spend all that time writing if it was something I didn't really care that much about. So I thought maybe we could combine sports and politics in some way. So that's how I started to think about it. And then I thought, like, well, you know, I, I've always been interested in presidential politics. Like, what could we do about presidents and the sports they played, loved, and watched, and what that tells us about who they are? Now, I will tell you, when I initially thought of the idea, I thought, surely... Someone else has done this. That, I mean, that I feel like is anytime you write a book or, or come up with the idea for a book, your biggest fear is you've got this idea you're excited about. You type it into the internet, and like a book came out in 2019 called Politics and the Presidency or, so, or Presidency in Sports. So 
I sort of quickly Googled it up, you know, before I wrote the book proposal and all that. And really, there are a couple academic presses that had done some stuff. I, one guy read, wrote a whole book about Richard Nixon in sports. I mean, it's... Yeah, we're I, mean, gonna I, guess, we're I guess there's an audience I'm for gonna, that. I'm going to ask you about yeah. Richard Nixon here in a minute. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, a whole book, you know. Um, but no one had really done it. So, you know, at that point, I thought, I've always wanted to do this. I've, the one thing that I've always been gifted with is to be able to write fast. And well is somewhat more debatable, but fast has always been something I've been able to do. So I thought, I, I can manage this. You know, I think it's a little daunting anytime you start thinking like, you know, my, my um, editor was like, we need 60,000 words by Labor Day 2022. And so, you know, back in January of 2022, that feels really daunting. You know, you like open up the Microsoft Word document and you're like, <laughs> and like right, you know, I would like go on like a writing binge and I'd like do the word count and it'd be like 520. And I was like, oh boy. <laughs> so, I mean, it was daunting at first, but you know, it's like everything else. You sort of do a little bit and then you do a little bit more and you do a little bit more and you sort of build momentum and, and get there. But it was, it was a, it was a process, I guess is the, is the answer. It was not sort of like lightning bolt, you know, and then I wrote it in a week. Okay. The, the first, the one thing I want to know, did you, have you had any feedback from the presidents, positive or negative? I've heard positive things. Now, uh, I'm not sure they would tell me negative things. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, well, they might. Um, I, I think the thing that I liked about the book is I had spent the last six, five, five years at CNN covering Donald Trump, uh, mostly. I mean, obviously, I covered other stuff too, but that was the big story. As you might guess, that can be a soul-sucking experience at times. Um, not, not necessarily because of Donald Trump, but because of everything that goes on around it, right? It's just every, it, it, you had to be on at all times. Everything he said and did was hugely polarizing. People hated you because of where you worked. You know, like people would show up at my, the, I made the mistake of, of keeping my house. My house was, uh, when, I, when I bought my house, it was, uh, I was not on television. But it's publicly listed where I live. So people would show up at my house. Like, it was not great. Uh, and so I wanted to do something in politics, but not so, so partisan. And one thing that was nice about the book is my pitch to everyone, including Skip and Mac, McClarty, and everybody I talked to down here for Clinton, was, look, I don't need you to tell me what you think of Donald Trump or, you know, what you think of the 20, uh, of January 6, 2021. Or, you know, I don't... I'm much more focused on what do you think of the, you know, these things that happen, like did he care about sports, did he like sports, what, what role did sports play in their presidency? It was a much more pleasant series of conversations to have, honestly, uh, than the conversations I was having in my day job, uh, which made it really kind of a, a you know, and I think, I think as a result got more people to talk to me than might have if I was writing a book about like Donald Trump's presidency, which there are a billion of. One of the things you said in your book, which I found it interesting, was you said that Teddy Roosevelt and Dwight Eisenhower thought sports prepared people for war. Yeah. Uh, after Eisenhower, do you think any of the presidents have thought sports prepared them for war? So quickly on... on um uh, that, you know, they believe so strongly uh, in the war as, sports as war that uh, Roosevelt stepped in when college football was so, college football was very violent. They didn't wear helmets, people were dying on the field, et cetera, et cetera. He stepped in to save college football. It's hilarious to me because he's, <laughs> who he met with, it's, it's very different than like the SEC dominated world we, we live in now. He met with like the president of Yale and the president of Harvard. These were like the big football powerhouses of the day for exactly that reason. He, he cared about football, but he viewed football in particular as a way to prepare young men for eventual service. Um, I think the answer to your question is no. Okay. I think once you got beyond Eisenhower, I think the I, I don't think that LBJ or Kennedy or, or 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 Nixon were thinking of Vietnam when they were were 
you know, advocating for sports. I do think very much that World War II generation, however, it's very closely linked. And, and the other thing too is, all of those presidents who came of age during that time, uh, up to about Reagan, all played football. So one thing that's hilarious, just a very quick aside. So Richard Nixon is like not a good athlete. I mean, I don't think that Richard Nixon would not be offended if he was here. He was not a particularly good athlete. But Richard Nixon played college football yeah. um, at Whittier College, very small school that he went to in California. Um, and what's interesting about it is there's all these great accounts of when he was playing, he was essentially like a tackling dummy for the, the good guys. I mean, this is by their own admission. I mean, this is not me casting aspersions on Richard Nixon. He was sort of like a, a, a dummy, like a guy who just was there to like get in the way. But Nixon learns like a very important lesson there, which is sort of it's, you know, cliche, but it's not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. I mean, he, he literally internalizes that message that his gift is he keeps getting knocked down and he keeps getting, get, get, keeps getting back up. He's not particularly athletically gifted. God knows he wasn't socially particularly gifted. I mean, he's, he's one of the most awkward people to ever be elected president, certainly. But his gift is his resilience and his will. And I think that very much does carry over throughout his presidency. You, again, you could argue for good or ill, but that is one of his great strengths is he keeps coming back. He keeps getting up. Um, and that was a lesson I think he very much took from football. But, but to circle back, uh, Skip, it, 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 no. It, it, I, I, and I think there's a reason that you see the presidents after Reagan play all sorts of different sports. George H.W. Bush plays golf and tennis and, 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 and that sort of thing. Baseball. Uh, Obama plays basketball. Uh, Clinton, you know, runs. Um, it, there's not that uniform. Well, I mean, there's not that uniformity of of sort of like football is the thing that every ambitious young man plays, and that's very much the case in that World War II generation. When you write about Nixon, uh, tomorrow night uh, Hillary Clinton's going to be in Little Rock, and she's doing a program with Robert Putnam, the author of Bowling Alone. Uh, it is a great book. Um, but Richard Nixon bowled alone a lot. Bowling was a sport that he did by himself. So it is, if you've seen The Big Lebowski, you probably know, or you grew up in the Nixon era, you know that Nixon bowled. Okay, there's the famous poster of Nixon bowling with the tie on, black and white picture, right? He's bowling with the tie on. So a couple things about that. One, it's not as weird then as it feels like it is now. Like if, if all of a sudden Joe Biden took up bowling, for example, you'd be like, well, it's kind of weird. Like, bowling is a pretty minor sport. Like, it's on ESPN2 at 2 o'clock in the morning, maybe. Back then, bowling was a really big deal. Um, there were bowling leagues everywhere. Uh, the first person to be sponsored by a company, first athlete to be sponsored by a company was a bowler, which is totally a great piece of trivia I didn't know until I wrote the book. Um, so it's, I would say, in, in Nixon's defense, it's not as weird as it might sound today. That said, it was still kind of weird. Um, he had lanes installed at the, at the White House. Um, he was very open about his bowling habit. He, he told the press corps, I mean, talk about things that would never happen now. He was doing a press event, and he started, he, he, he was proud of what a good bowler he was, so he bragged about it. And he said, I'm paraphrasing, he said something like, I'll go down there at 10 o'clock at night when I've had a hard day, and I'll bowl 10 or 12 games. It's like, <laughs> you went at 10 o'clock at night and bowled 12 bowling, like 12 full games by yourself? Like, that seems odd. Um, but he was a, you know, he was very much, and, and for folks who, who are of an age and were alive when he was, you know, president, like, he very much was a loner. Um, he, he was a guy who was uncomfortable in social settings. Um, bowling appealed to him because it was him versus the pins, really. Um, he was a, quite a good bowler. He bowled a 260 at one point in his life. I mean, he bowled a lot uh, at the White House. Um, but I do think that image that you note, Skip, you know, the, the image of Nixon sort of rolling frame after frame alone at 11.30 p.m. in the White House, 
you could do worse for a metaphor of the Nixon presidency than that. You know what I mean? Like, it's almost like, I, I remember doing the research and talking to people and writing about it. It's like almost too on the nose that he, he did that. Um, but yeah. yes, he, he, was a, he was our last, maybe we'll have another, but certainly our last bowling aficionado in the White House. Chris, the first time I encountered the uh, Secret Service was in Fayetteville, Arkansas, as a student at the University of Arkansas, when Richard Nixon came to the Arkansas-Texas shootout in 1969. You noted that he played football, but was that a football trip or was that a political trip? Political trip. So Nixon, Nixon sort of, this will not surprise you, Nixon sort of popularized the idea of that sports could be used as a political persuasion tactic. Uh, Kennedy did a little of it with football and, and, you know, Hyannis and, you know, the idea that he was healthy when he was in fact not. But Nixon really popularizes it. So Nixon, by the way, to go back to bowling, Nixon believed that bowlers were very much part of the silent majority. Middle class, white, uh, suburban uh, slash rural people who bowled were very much part of the Nixon coalition. He thinks this, he's at least told by his advisors in memo after memo, college football fans are the same. These are your people. So he's going to the, this is pre the BCS, obviously, in a national championship yeah. game. He's going to the game because the game is billed as the, the, uh, effectively the national championship game. Arkansas and Texas are both undefeated. Um, and he's going there, I think, to identify with his people. Now, one fascinating thing about it. At halftime, he goes into the announcing booth. It's, it's broadcast on national TV. He goes into the announcing booth. And Arkansas is ahead. It's a very low scoring game, but Arkansas is ahead. And Nixon says something like, you know, I, I think Texas is going to ultimately pull this out. Now, Texas wins. And there is a young man named William Jefferson Clinton watching that game, obviously rooting for Arkansas. And he remembers to this day how pissed off he was that Nixon plays the role of, of, of sports handicapper and predicts Texas wins, and Texas goes on to win. So it's, you know, it's a fascinating. Talk about, like, history running into each other. But, yeah, Nixon, I think, understood that sports, in a lot of ways, was cultural currency. Um, sports was a way he used to identify with people. Again, he was very awkward, naturally. He, he was bad at small talk. But he was really into sports. So he knew a lot about baseball, for example. Like, again, not a, a big nerd who's, like, really into baseball. Like, not that surprising. <laughs> um, he would talk baseball with people. Uh, he and Ted Williams were very close. Williams, obviously, was quite conservative. W one fascinating thing is that John F. Kennedy, even when he was president, always tried to get Williams to endorse him. And Williams would always, I mean, because Massachusetts, and Williams would always resist and say, I'm a Nixon man. Um, but Nixon grasped that sports was a way that he could connect with people in a way that he really struggled to connect with people otherwise. And that sports could be a stand-in for a lot of cultural values that he wanted to sort of run on and instill this idea of sort of, you know, uh, more moral values and, and the benefit of hard work and, and excellence and those sorts of things that he could, he could use sports as, a, as an entry point to those cultural touchstones that he struggled with otherwise. Obviously, we've seen in the modern era, presidents have done that, you know, more overtly. I mean, Donald Trump obviously is a, an er example of sort of using sports, whether it's, you know, telling LeBron James he likes Michael Jordan better or disinviting the Golden State Warriors from the White House. He's done this over and over again, often on the negative side. But, but Nixon really starts that. One of the things you pointed out in the book, which I found interesting because I would have thought uh, it, this would not have been your choice. You say the most athletic modern president was George H.W. Bush. Yes. I would have guessed Gerald Ford. So, okay. So you've got me there. Um, no, I don't mean to get you. What, I just is, would have so guessed is, Gerald Ford. No, but one, I'm of the, wrong. one of the problems with writing a book is you can't change it after it's already been written. Um, so, Gerald Ford was an elite level athlete at one thing. Right, Gerald Ford was a, a football player. He played at Michigan. 
he had pro offers. Talk about things that don't happen now. He had pro offers from the Lions and the Bears after college. He turned them down to go to law school. <laughs> like, not, not, not a path that I think most professional athletes would take now. So at that one thing Gerald Ford was, was absolutely excellent. At, and, and is a better better football player than George H.W. Bush was at anything, period. So I should have probably made that point. George H.W. Bush is just good at lots of things. Um, he's a, his mother is really good at tennis. They, I mean, again, this is part of like the landed gentry upbringing that he had. They played tennis a lot. Uh, he is a pretty good golfer. Uh, he is an excellent baseball player. He plays first base for Yale, uh, he's, everything that I could tell, again, it's kind of hard to find scouts of the Yale baseball team, so like this is all secondhand stuff, but he's a slick fielding, weak hitting first baseman. Never was, there, there was never a question of like when George H.W. Bush graduated from Yale, is he gonna go play professionally? He's not that good. Um, but, sidebar that I thought was totally interesting, there's a great picture, if you've never seen it, look it up. George H.W. Bush, as a young man, I think he's 20 or 21, meets Babe Ruth. And the way that it happens is Babe Ruth is, is dying. Babe Ruth dies a month after he meets George H.W. Bush. But Babe Ruth is donating his memoir to Yale. Uh, George H.W. Bush is the captain of the Yale baseball team. So, it, you know, they need somebody to sort of greet uh, Babe Ruth, shake his hand. So there's a picture of George H.W. Uh, Bush as a 21-year-old shaking hands with George Herman Babe Ruth, uh, which to me is just, again, these, these fascinating intersections of history, right? But one other thing about him in baseball that he plays, <laughs> so do you guys remember, they used to have, uh, during the MLB All-Star game every, you know, in the summer, they used to have something called the Old Timers game. Do you remember this? Yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm 47. When I was a kid, I was born in 1976. In 83, 84, 85, I vaguely remember it. So they'd have like Will, Willie Mays at 55 would like be playing center field. Okay, so, but it's in Texas. It's in Houston in 83, I think. Though don't quote me, it's in the book. Um, and Bush is there to do an event. And he, he runs into, um, he runs into, I think it's Warren Spahn. And Warren Spahn is like, you got to come out. Like, it's tomorrow night. He, he's not planning to go to the All-Star game at all, right? But you got to come. You got to come out. Like, come out. Just do a guest appearance. And, like, he's, he, his people are like, yeah, he's VP at this time. And his people are like, like, we haven't, like, cased the joint. We don't really know. Like, so he's like, okay. I'll, like, I'll come and say hi. So they come. He comes. And they have a uniform for him. So, like, put the uniform on. And he's like, okay. You know, he's, like, totally getting roped into it. Then they're like, Go out and play first base. <laughs> and he's like, uh, uh, you know, and he's like all these like, you know, these guys he look up to, you know, these heroes, Harmon Killebrew, you know, these people he looked up to, he's, they're his contemporaries. They're like, get out there, you're good. So he goes out there and he makes like what is by all accounts like a really amazing play on like a hard line drive. So he's, you know, comes off the field and he's feeling real confident about himself, feeling great about himself. And they're like, go out and hit. <laughs> Which, you know, again, like, this is just so funny to me in 2023. Like, I, you know, imagine if they were, like, uh, said to, like, Dick Cheney, like, hey, go out to the All-Star game. Go out and hit. He'd be like, no, we're not doing that. He goes out and hits, and he gets a hit. And the crowd goes bananas, right? Like, it's a – so, again, he's not an elite athlete. He's a pretty good baseball player. He's a better baseball player, certainly, than I am. He's a better baseball player than most of the people we know. He's not an amazing uh, baseball player, but he's so active and stays active throughout his life. And I think one thing I do want to mention, because I think it's really important, is one of the things that the sort of through lines of the book is these politicians are into sports for a very specific reason. They're really competitive people. You don't put yourself out in the public eye. I mean, think about what running for president means. You say... I, of 300 and whatever, 30 million people in this country, I am the best person to represent all of you. It takes a huge act of ambition, ego, and, and competitive desire, right? I'm going to spend the next two years of my life, maybe longer, in this process that is not a great process, you know, on your family, on, on your life, on your livelihood. But it's that competitiveness that sort of I think attracts them all to sports and attracts them to politics. It's it's the sort of the common thread that the the idea of being 
performing in public, being judged in some way by the public, being adored. I mean, you know, we can talk about Bill Clinton, but, but the desire for adoration by the public. Um, and Bush is, is a, sort of the centerpiece of the book in that regard. You know, there's a, I talked to his daughter, daughter Doro, um, George W. and, and Jeb's sister. And she said that, I love this story, it's one of my favorite in the book. She said that as he got older, he would compete, he would play a game with the grandkids of who could fall asleep first at night. <laughs> Which, by the way, is like a great parenting tactic that I wish I had known when my kids, my kids are 14 and 11, I wish I had known it when they were like four and one. Um, but, but that, to me, it like defines who the guy fundamentally is. He's just an avid competitor. There's stories in the book about horseshoes. He starts a horseshoe league. Uh, in the White House and organizes it and has brackets and has a horseshoe coordinator who's like a 22-year-old kid who has like business cards that say horseshoe coordinator. Um, so he's, that's who the guy fundamentally is. So that's, in some ways, I was sort of entranced by Bush, H.W. Bush, because he's, he, he embodied so much of sort of what intrigued me about presidents and sports to start. Well, speaking of Bush, one of the most powerful sports moments yeah. of any president was that October World Series game yep. in Yankee Stadium after 9-11, where President George W. Bush walked out on the mound through a perfect strike yep. uh, for the opening pitch. That probably solidified George W. Bush and baseball, although he was connected with baseball anyway and t-ball, but that moment was a powerful sports story. So, yes, I think if you ask, if I, if I asked you guys, like, name a moment when sports and politics came into direct contact, 75% of you would be like, when Bush threw out the first pitch at the World Series. Right? It's like the iconic moment of that happening. Um, it's a really interesting story. I would urge you, there's a wonderful documentary about it that is worth watching, um, that is on YouTube, actually. Uh, so, Major League Baseball actually asks, so it's Arizona and the Yankees, are in the, the Diamondbacks and the Yankees are in the World Series. Major League Baseball actually asks Bush to throw out the first pitch of game one, but the first, the first two games are in Arizona. So Bush is like, no, if I'm, if I'm going to do this, and it's obviously going to be a hugely like symbolic moment for the country, like I'm going to do it at Yankee Stadium. So it's actually game three of the World Series that he, he throws out the first pitch. Um, he's underneath Yankee Stadium, like underneath every uh, professional baseball stadium. There are batting cages and there are mounds and all that stuff so they can warm up. So Bush, who is a prideful guy, who is the son of a college baseball player, who is the son of a competitive maniac, um, is warming up. He wants to you know, make sure he gets it there. Like everyone who's ever thrown a first pitch ever. It's like you don't want to be 50 cent and throw the ball 75 feet to the left. Um, Derek Jeter, the captain of the Yankees, the sort of face of the Yankees at the time, and probably still, walks by and says, are you going to throw from the mound? And, and Bush says, well, you know, I thought I'd throw from the front of the mound. I mean, if you follow first pitches, which, you know, I do because it's a weird thing that I'm into, most politicians throw from the front of the mound because like 60 feet is further than you think to like not throw like a looping ball. Like you want it to look good so you make sure you get it there. And Bush is like, well, uh, so then Jeter's like, yeah, I really think you should. So then Bush is like, oh my God, <laughs> now I got to like do it from the mound. He, it's really interesting. I would, again, I would urge you to watch it. It, it. I know it probably feels like yesterday. Obviously it was long, 20 plus years ago. He's announced by John Sterling, the, the, the PA announcer, you know, the President of the United States, George W. Bush. He obviously has a bulletproof vest on, which is an additional challenge to, to throwing a ball. It's, I've not worn one, but it would suggest it is. Um, the crowd is, like, weirdly muted. And I don't think it's about George W. Bush, by the way. This is, this is pre-mission accomplished and pre-everything that the Iraq war, right? Like, he goes out there, people are like, yeah, you know, he goes out there. But I do think it captures a moment in time of where we were. There were threats on his life that night. There were, if you guys remember, you know, this was still, this was early October 2001. There were still reports that there was going to be another attack, right? People were nervous. Yeah. He goes out there. He goes to the mound. Obviously, you know, he throws the ball right down the middle. 
Um, the crowd, and again, you, I watched this a bunch of times because I wrote about it. The crowd goes bananas. Um, and, and for me, it crystallizes that, like, it's not just about, like, hey, he threw the ball off the mound and it was a strike. You know, like, ah, sports, all right. It's about, you know, in that moment, it crystallizes for a lot of people, we're down but not out. We, you know, we've, we've been knocked down, but, but we can get through this. I know it's just a guy standing on a mound throwing a ball 60 feet. I get it. But the symbolism of that and the fact that he did, everyone remembers, he didn't bounce it. He threw it hard. It went right over the plate. I think for a lot of people was symbolically really, really important. Uh, you know, I, I write about this in the book. You, you can debate this, but there are there there are two moments that are the best moments of George W. Bush's presidency. One is when he's on the pile and he has the microphone and he says, he, uh, the megaphone, and he says, "I hear you," and soon the whole world's going to hear us, and people go, but you know, people go crazy. The other one is clearly that moment on the mound, um, and and I think for me, it really like typified what sports can mean and what sports and politics can mean when combined together. You know, you, uh, the image of John F. Kennedy, touch football, a very active Kennedy competitiveness. We now know that John Kennedy was very sick and, and, uh, and with Addison's disease and all sorts of complicated issues, but he was an excellent swimmer. He was. And when PT-109, we talk about PT-109 and him leading the groups and taking it. He survived because he was a good swimmer. Absolutely. And I will tell you, as a uh, – Kennedy was before my time. I knew the PT-109 thing and that he had been sort of lionized and it had set the, the, the um, groundwork for everything that came after the House run, the Senate run, the presidency. What I didn't know until I wrote the book was the details of what he actually did. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a pretty remarkable thing. I mean, he's doing, there's a guy who's injured, one of his crew members is injured. I mean, he's swimming with him for miles on end in the dark, basically to avoid capture. Um, he, he makes these huge swims overnight and saves people. I mean, it's genuine heroism that was in fact due to the fact that he was a competitive Swimmer, uh, you know, I, I took swim lessons as a kid. I uh, feel comfortable jumping in a pool. There's no way in hell I could have done a swim like he did. I, I would urge the, the details of it are, are, which you may be familiar with, you may not be familiar with, are pretty fascinating. Um, I mentioned just while we're on Kennedy, um, I mentioned Nixon was sort of the president that sort of grasped politics and sports and what could be used. There are, you could make the argument that Kennedy sort of predated that. A lot of it was Joe Kennedy, his dad, in truth. You know, his dad was sort of a master manipulator of, of the media and, and, and the political landscape. Um, the touch football games were on purpose. As Skip mentioned, you know, he's a very ill man. Um, he has to use crutches frequently when he's in the White House. Obviously, he has Addison, we learn later he has Addison's disease. His back is terrible. I mean, he, he can't participate in 90% of these games because of his back. Um, and yet, the overriding image that all of us have of the Kennedy presidency is that lawn and them throwing the football to one another. Now, what was Jack Kennedy really good at? Golf. Excellent golfer. But most of us don't think of Kennedy as a golfer, and that's on purpose. Because they were ar two things. One, Kennedy had been very critical of Eisenhower for how much Eisenhower golfed. Now, Eisenhower, and this is in the book, Eisenhower golfed a lot. Um, you think Trump golfed a lot, you think Obama golfed a lot, you think Clinton golfed a lot. Eisenhower golfed more than all of them. I mean, it's not even close. You could never do what Eisenhower did now. Eisenhower would take uh, two months off in the summer and go to Colorado and just play golf every single day. I mean, it was a different era, obviously. But Kennedy is a really gifted natural golfer. He, he plays, but they are very careful to make sure that he is not caught on camera much. There's a few images, there's a few things on YouTube of Kennedy swinging and stuff, but that he's not caught on camera much golfing because they're worried about the Eisenhower criticism and him being a hypocrite. And they're worried about this idea that he's just a rich guy, you know, whose daddy made him, and he plays what was still at the time considered sort of a, an elitist sport. 
So you won't see a lot of images of Kennedy golfing, but you will see a lot of images of Kennedy playing football because football was sort of a, you know all American and, and middle class and middle America. Um, so he, you know this will not come as a surprise to you. Kennedy cultivated a very careful image of who he was publicly that contrasted with who he actually was privately. Sports was a big part of that mystique too. Pick up basketball, it will forever be associated with Barack Obama. Uh, and obviously, you know, playing pick up basketball with the University of North Carolina a basketball team obviously had a political overtones. But Barack Obama did something else is that he started, he got, he captured people's attentions by filling out brackets. And people were anxious to see who. Obama chose to win the national championship. Can you talk about Obama's uh, connection with sports and politics? Absolutely. So I, I was reminded of this. So I'm, you know, I'm, uh, it's August and I'm getting ready for the first debate, which I also did not totally remember what day it was on. Sorry. And I thought of this because Doug Burgum, who literally no one outside of North Dakota has heard of, but Doug Burgum is the governor of North Dakota and is running for president. Doug Burgum tore his Achilles playing pickup basketball the day before the Repu first Republican debate. So I was like, holy cow, imagine if that happened to Obama, because they would play all the time. Um, Obama's relationship with basketball is, is again, th this was affirming in writing the book, it, it goes well beyond just sports. Obama meets his father twice in his entire life. One of the two times is at Christmas. His father, again, he really doesn't know his father in any meaningful way. His father gives him as a gift, this one of two times he meets him, he gives him as a gift a basketball. Now, it's kind of a weird gift in that at the time, basketball, where his father lives in Africa, basketball is not a big deal in Africa. Barry Obama, as he's known then, has never really expressed any particular interest in basketball. But I think Obama, Obama the Younger, sees it and realizes over time that it's a way, this is a kid, right, white mother, black African father, grandparents in Hawaii, named Barack Hussein Obama. There are not, he doesn't fit naturally in any of the categories that many of our pre presidents fit in, right? This is someone who from an early age, he's written about this many times, has struggles with where he fits. Is he white? Is he black? You know, is he, is he African? Is he, is he American? What, who, who am I? Basketball gives him a group. It gives him people who he identifies with. It helps him identify with black culture in a, in a meaningful way. Um, at the time, he's living with his grandparents in Hawaii, the, and I write about this in the book, the University of Hawaii basketball team has, for the first time in history, has five black guys uh, as starters. He feels a kinship with them. Um, so it makes, it, it does help to explain who he is, how he fits, how he finds, as he writes about very eloquently, sort of straddling the two worlds that he is a part of. Um, he uses basketball overtly in, in the White House for a couple of reasons. One, he's a big NBA fan and he's the, also the President of the United States. When that happens to be the case, you can meet people like Kobe Bryant, Chris Paul, LeBron James, you know, these people who are, you know, he looks up to. So he has, for, for one of his birthdays, he has a bunch of them and they play pickup basketball. Now, quick aside on Obama, again, talk about, make, it's really hard to get a fully accurate measure of how good Barack Obama is at basketball. Because he's still alive, so people aren't going to be like, he's terrible, like, it's easy. Um, so I talked to Reggie Love, who played at, at Duke and was his body man for many years. And Reggie said he's a better than average pickup player who sort of plays within himself. He's left-handed, which is an advantage. He's a pretty good shooter, not a great driver, pretty good at fitting into a group, which again, it's so telling about Obama, right? Obama can fit into almost any group, right? Um, but the other thing that he does, you mentioned the brackets, he, he understands that like this can be a thing, again, if you're named Barack Hussein Obama, you have a white Kansas mother, a Kenyan father. One of the issues that Barack Obama had was relating to the average person, right? The average person was like, this seems exotic and weird to me. Well, what does everyone, including people who don't care about sports, do in March? Right. Like, you know, I mean, whether you pick it because you, like, think, like, what mascot is funny, 
or you know, you you spend hours pouring like my kids spend hours pouring over like each team. Everybody fills out a bracket. You do it through work, you do it through home, you know, you have a family bracket, like it's a thing, it's a communal experience. So during the 2008 campaign, Andy Katz, who at the time worked for ESPN, was doing uh, big takeout uh, TV pieces for ESPN that never actually ran on McCain and Obama and sports. So he's got an interview with Obama. I think they're in North Carolina. And he's got an interview with Obama. They're in some hotel. They do the interview. It's 15 minutes or whatever. Obama's got to go give a speech. It's a Sunday. They get up to, you know, leave. And... Uh, David Axelrod comes in with Robert Gibbs, who's the press secretary at the time, and comes in and says, can we have you hold here for a minute? Hold in this hotel room. So, you know, Katz is like, mm, okay. And what has happened is Colin Powell has endorsed Barack Obama. You remember when that happened. What they're trying to do is figure out, like, well, <laughs> what should we say? You know, they're sort of on the fly thing. Goes so Andy Katz, smartly, like any good reporter, sees his opportunity. And he says, hey, I do these bracket things. Like, what if we did it? In the he knows Obama's a sports fan. What if we did it in the White House? That's the genesis of how it happens. Obama agrees to it. Katz thinks, sure, of course he says yes now, but like if he gets elected president, there's no way he does it. They follow up, they do it, and it becomes a huge thing um, that, again, I do think it's a way to humanize Barack Obama. Like, of course you do the analysis of like, did he pick North Carolina because he wants to win North Carolina, right? But, but ultimately it's a thing that humanizes him to a lot of people. Like, oh, his bracket is busted just like my bracket is busted. So, again, though, I think basketball culturally, um, philosophically, it, there's so much about Obama that mm -hmm. basketball explains. You, you talked about, and we'll, we'll get to questions from y'all in just a second, you talked about um, golf. And obviously you talked about Eisenhower playing a lot, and he even had a, he even had a little putting green installed. Right. Right. Clinton has a putting green installed on, in his residence in the presidential library. So. <laughs> So Eisenhower had a putting green, Clinton has one. Uh, of all of them, for, through Trump, in your opinion, who was the best golfer? Okay. This allows me to talk about Trump and golf. Um, Kennedy is the most naturally gifted golfer. Um, his back winds up, he, he really can't play after a certain point. But Kennedy, I, there's a guy at Golf Magazine who is a swing analyst. That's all he does. So I called him up and I was like, his name's Luke Curdenine, he's Australian. Um, I called him up and I said, can you just, I have footage of all these guys, can you just look at them and just tell me who has like the best natural swing? And he's like, oh, he did it, which was amazing. He's like, Kennedy by far. Okay, so that. Um, in terms of handicap, we're getting into dicey territory here, as you will soon see. Donald Trump has the lowest handicap on the like USGA handicap system of any president. He also has won, according to him, um, <laughs> I think it's up to 15 club championships. Now, is Donald Trump a good enough golfer to win one club, cha club championship? The answer to that is no. Uh, Donald Trump is like a six or seven handicap, which means, which, by the way, for someone who is 77 years old, is pretty damn good. I mean, I'm like a 20. He shoots six or seven over par, usually. He's a good golfer. I know people who've played with him, they say he's a good golfer. Yes, he does cheat, but he's, like, generally speaking, <laughs> generally speaking, a good golfer. So one of the things I looked at in the book is, like, how the heck does John... Club champions, by the way, if you're not a member of a club or you're not familiar, a club champion is usually like a scratch golfer, like somebody who shoots par, maybe one under par. I mean, these people are excellent at golf. Um, he is not that good. So uh, one of the things I was interested in, just because prurient interest mainly, I was like, how the heck did he win 14 club championships? So I talked to a bunch of people, including Rick Riley, who wrote a wonderful book about Donald Trump and golf, if you're interested. Uh, I believe it's called President in Cheat. You can, <laughs> you can figure out where it goes from there. Um, he does a couple things to, to win these things. One, he buys a golf course and plays the first round at the golf course and declares himself the club champion. <laughs> Which again, if you're familiar with how club championships work, it's like an actual tournament that you play in. It's not like you just declare yourself. The other thing that he does is he finds out what the low score was that the club champion shot. 
And if he ever in any round, at any course, shoots below that number, he declares himself the club champion. Um, I think it was last year. Was it last year? I, I think it was last year. Do you know who Diamond and Silk are? The, one of them has passed away. I think it was Diamond. He's at Diamond's funeral in North Carolina on a Friday. On Saturday morning, he's back at Mar-a-Lago, and the people who are competing, the club championship is Friday, Saturday. The people who are competing in the club championship are surprised to see Donald Trump is at the top of the leaderboard when they get there on Saturday. He has not played, mind you. He was in North Carolina at a funeral. It's well documented. And the reason was he had shot a low round earlier in the week that he was counting <laughs> for that. So, um, again, what's hard, I think what's hard about Trump is, and sports in general, is he's pretty good as an athlete. He was a quite good baseball player in high school. He says he was the best baseball player in New York State. He was not, in fact, the best baseball player in New York State. Um, so he lets, the, he lets the, the great get in the way of the, the good. Um, I just Can I tell one Trump story? You bet. Okay. Tell it. So I, I want to get to y'all's questions. There's just one that I think is so, um, is so telling. So do you know what sport Donald Trump played in college? Do you have any guesses? He played a sport in college for one semester. <laughs> Not horse user ping pong, squash. So he went to Fordham. He went to Fordham. He doesn't mention this. He, he talks much more about the Wharton School of Business at Penn, but he went to Fordham and he played squash. He would drive, his father was wealthy. He had a sports car as a college kid. He would drive his friends on the team to and from games, uh, matches. So at one point, they're playing the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, and they lose. And they're all pissed off, and you know they're driving back to, to Fordham. And Trump pulls off the road and stops at, again, this will date the story, but stops at a Woolworths general store and buys, comes out. The guys are waiting in the car. Comes out. He's got a brand new set of golf clubs and a bunch of golf ba uh, balls. They drive to this desolate spot overlooking the Chesapeake Bay, and they hit golf balls. You know, let off steam. They hit golf balls off the... Uh, uh, into the water for whatever, 45 minutes. At the end of that, they're like, should we pack the golf clubs back up, you know, put them in the car? He's like, nah, just leave them. Off they drive back. It just is so telling to me, like Donald, Donald Trump, you know, everything is, everything is sort of, uh, it can pass. Everything, it, it, it that doesn't matter, immaterial. Uh, you know, like just walk away, it doesn't matter. Just leave the clubs. Um, and that's sort of how he did sports. Uh, um, talked to a bunch of people about him golfing. He only cares about driving the ball. Doesn't care about pitching, doesn't care about putting, only cares about hitting long drives. He was at Aberdeen, one of his courses in Aberdeen, Scotland, Turnberry. It, this is recently. He turns to the reporters and said, you think Joe Biden could hit it 280 like that down the center of the fairway? Like it's how he, that's how he measures himself. In baseball, he was, he only cared about hitting home runs. He didn't care about anything else. He didn't care about sort of advancing runners. He didn't care, he cared about hitting home runs. Like, it's so pathological and so on the nose that again, it's almost too perfect. But that's, that's who the guy is in sports and everything else. I mean, the, the, the thing that I learned about this book is who you think these people are is almost always reinforced by who they, how they approached sports in their lives. It, it, it's just, it's a window directly into their souls. Okay. Anybody got any questions for Chris? Yes. 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 Well, it, repeat the question. So the question is, there's, there's, there is absolutely a huge thing about Eisenhower and whether he played Amateur or professional baseball and whether that could have disqualified him from the Naval Academy. That, that's the issue. So, at the time when Eisenhower was a young man, he was a, uh, quite a good athlete. He actually played football. He hurt his knee. Back then, hurting your knee was uh, akin to your career. And it's not like it is now where you can come back. Medicine was not what it was. He hurts his knee. Anyway, he's a very good athlete as a teenager and as a young man. He's trying to earn, the story goes, he's trying to earn some money 
for, before he goes to the Naval Academy. His family is not a family of means. He, he's like the first person to go to college, et cetera, et cetera. At the time, there are these touring companies of baseball players, amateurs mostly, who go around and play in various communities, particularly in the Midwest. There are some reports that he, under an assumed name, played baseball and was paid for it, and therefore should not, therefore sacrificed his amateur status and should not have been admitted to the Naval Academy and should not have gone. I, again, the records from the 19... 30s are a little bit spotty as to amateur baseball teams in Kansas. It's not a, a, there's not a treasure trove of information. Um, there are six or seven people with the name that he allegedly played under. It's never been proven that that is him, though Eisenhower himself did at one point say, yes, I played professional baseball. Now, again, was that him as... Uh, politicians are want to do is that him pumping up his own actual a athletic accomplishments one sidebar Bill Clinton once said in an interview that and Bill Clinton was no great athlete he was a band guy uh, once said that he dunked a basketball in a church basketball league again probably apocryphal but but they have a tendency to boost up their accomplishments so it's never clear whether Eisenhower actually did it or not but I will tell you if you type into Google Dwight Eisenhower and amateur baseball, there, again, talk about things people have written a book about. There is a guy in Kansas who's written an entire book, I talked to him, about whether Dwight Eisenhower violated his amateur status by playing professional baseball, so. Okay, we got a question about him, and, and, and go ahead. Oh, thank you. Chris, welcome to Little Rock, thank and you. I know how hard it is to say no to Dean Rutherford, so yeah. I, I, I appreciate I you being here. Yes. I, wanna, I wanna flip this just a little bit and get your comments, and so, Talk, we talked about politics and people in politics, presidents specifically, and, and their relationship to sports. I'm going to throw three names out at you, and I want your insight on this. Okay. okay? Jesse Ventura, mm -hmm. Herschel Walker, mm -hmm. Tommy Tuberville. Sports figures who yep. have come into politics, yep. and your your side of what how that relationship yeah, works. Yeah, so I think they're all obviously a little bit different, but I think the thing that ties them together is politics is harder than it looks. Um, yeah, yeah, uh, I know, breaking news. Um, I, I think especially as it relates to Walker and Tupperville. Uh, I still remember, you didn't mention him, but I still remember Tom Osborne, who was the legendary coach at the University of Nebraska, ran for governor. And everyone just assumed, like, of course he'll win. He's Tom Osborne, right? And he loses. Um, it's not the same exact thing. And I think athletes struggle with that because they are celebrities, which is a huge advantage. Um, but the skill set required to be, I, I mentioned they share many common traits, being competitive, being ambitious, uh, generally speaking, being, Herschel Walker is not a great example of this, but generally speaking, being comfortable in the public eye, Herschel Walker was not, I don't think, particularly comfortable in the public eye for a variety of reasons. Um, but it's harder than it, it, it might look to translate over. I, I think in part because we still, at some level, separate sports and politics um, into lanes. I think increasingly that's going to be less and less important. I, I think... You've now, some of this is Trump. You know, you've got Donald Trump commenting on LeBron James wearing an I Can't Breathe shirt. You've got, you know, uh, uh, Barack Obama talking about the NBA and, and the NFL and going to games and all that. Like, increasingly those lanes are less evident, but I still think people are kind of like, you're the sports guy and you're the politics guy and never the twain shall meet. So it's a harder, um, I think it's a harder thing than people think. I think they just assume, like, I'm good at this one thing. Surely I'll be good at this other thing. By the way, athletes are far from the only people who do that. The number of rich people who are hugely successful in business, um, I, you know, uh, I think of, just because she probably spent the most, Meg Whitman, who by any account is a hugely successful businesswoman, right? I mean, she spent $180 million, which is, you know, a rounding error for her, but a lot of money, $180 million to run for governor in California and got 42% of the vote, you know, um, there are examples everywhere of that. I, I just think, I think people, athletes especially, underestimate how difficult it is, what the expectation level is. 
um, how the expectations are different than when you're in sports. You know, sports, not always, not if you're in New York or Boston, but usually sports figures get pretty laudatory press coverage. You're a hero. You know, in, I mean, Herschel Walker, when he was at Georgia and even after, you know, he's a hero in the state, right? I mean, he you know, brought a lot of attention to the state, Heisman Trophy, great, you know, greatest athlete ever, role model. He never was asked, like, what do you think of the capital gains tax? You know what I mean? Like, understandably, it's not that important for him to know that when he's an athlete. But if you're trying to be in the U.S. Senate, it's a bigger deal. And I, I think a different standard. Okay, we've got time for one more question. You know, I got one. If not, I've got one. We've got one. Yeah, right here. Um, so that was one of the most interesting chapters for me because I learned a lot, because you're exactly right. Um, I think, first of all, fascinating Jimmy Carter fact, he grows up in rural Georgia, obviously. There's, his father puts a clay tennis court in next to their house, which tennis is not like a huge deal in rural Georgia at the time. But, I don't know, maybe it is now, but it certainly wasn't then. But his father is like a, very into tennis and a sort of tennis aficionado, so he grows up playing tennis. Um, he is actually a pretty good basket. He's pretty diminutive, so this may seem odd, but he's a pretty good basketball player. He plays in high school. He's not a college-level basketball player, but he plays, he plays in high school. As he gets older, he gets into running. And um, this is pretty, I mean, I think a lot of people credit Clinton for sort of like bringing Clinton and Gore in their short shorts and, you know, going to McDonald's afterward. Uh, <laughs> They credit them for the running tide. But Jimmy Carter, like, running was sort of a thing in the late 70s, and he gets into it. But like a lot of things with Carter, it kind of goes wrong. He's doing this run in Catoctin, on Catoctin Mountain in Maryland near Camp David. And he, it's like a five-mile run. He should be able to do it, but it's hot that day. And he, like, passes out during the run. And it's a huge story. It's like, you know, Carter, is he weak? And, you know, is he... There's all these stories with Carter that are, like, really unfortunate. Do you know the story about him and the giant bunny rabbit? Yeah. Right? So, like, he's out fishing. Carter is very much an outdoorsman. He, he loves fly fishing. He's quite good at it. He fly fishes after this presidency. He's very much an outdoorsman, which he doesn't get credit for. But he's in a boat fishing, and, like, a wild rabbit that's large, like, approaches the boat. Now, by all, I mean... You know, I grew up in Connecticut, so wild rabbits approaching the boat were not really a thing. But, but then, you know, in Georgia, this was a thing. He, by all accounts, handles it totally fine and kind of bats it away with an oar. And that's the end of the story. But it becomes this massive national news story that he, like, fell out of the boat and he was scared. And there's a song, there's a country song about it. <laughs> and there really is. It's not a great country song, but there is a country song. You can find it. Uh, thank God for the internet. They got everything out there now. Um, and uh, it becomes like another sign that he's kind of weak and, and cowed by things that regular people are not cowed by. Again, I think it's a little bit of a misnomer. He's actually quite an active outdoorsman and accomplished outdoorsman. The other person that that applies for, by the way, is Jerry Ford. You know, the impression of, I mentioned Jerry Ford is probably the best elite athlete ever to be president. The impression of Jerry Ford, I assume if I asked you, is like clumsy. Oaf, dolt. Um, Jerry Ford's good at a lot of things. He's like an excellent skier, an excellent skier. He's a natural, he picks things up really easily. But two things combine to make the impression of Gerald Ford as uh, uh, wrong. One is Chevy Chase impersonating Gerald Ford on, uh, on Saturday Night Live, <laughs> who if you're of a certain age, you remember it. If you don't look it up, you know, he's picking up his shoe and talking on it like it's a phone. The other is his close friendship with Bob Hope, who Bob Hope is like the big comedian of that time. You know, Bob Hope's jokes about Jerry Ford in golf are legion. You know, the, the best way to find where Jerry Ford is on a golf course is to follow the ambulance, you know. <laughs> and so as a result, this guy who is like by all accounts an incredibly gifted, he played college football at Michigan, right? Not many people do that. He had offers to play for professional football. He is, he is in history's memory an oaf, a clumsy, um, you know, can't get out of his own way. Uh, Carter is like, the two of them are the ones that stood out to me the most where their public persona and how we remember them historically does not, in fact, come close to matching who they actually were in that world of sports and outdoors. Okay, so I'm not going to let you leave Little Rock without asking one political question. Beyond this is, I guess you could tie it to sports if you want to. <laughs> At this point, 
Do you think it's a Biden-Trump 2024 race? And do you think there are similarities with what happened in 2016 and 2020 about a very few battleground states? Yes, I, I would be stunned if it's not Biden versus Trump. Um, I, I think Trump is going to run away with the Republican. It's, it, it's probably the most boring Republican nomination we've had since, uh, it, 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 probably ever with a non-incumbent president. Um, if you watched the debate last night, again, I, it's my job, so I did it. Um, no one on that stage is going to beat him um, uh, or come close, in my opinion. Uh, I think we are headed for a rerun, which is a, a, a remarkable thing, given that more than half of the country thinks Joe Biden is too old to be president, and more than half of the country thinks Donald Trump is too corrupt to be president. Um, now, the 14th Amendment? No. Uh, sure, there's always a chance. I mean, look, I thought Hillary Clinton was going to be elected president in 2016. So, you know, take what I'm saying with a grain of salt. I, until it happens, I don't know. I think it's very unlikely secretaries of state and state legislatures, which is where it would have to happen, are going to do that in a way that would disqualify him from enough ballots that it would matter. Um, I, I think that uh, he... Someone has to win, right? <laughs> it, it, I mean, that's the way that I, I've thought about this for a while. There's only two of them, and one of them has to win. They have to get 270-whatever you know, electoral votes. Uh, we, there is a health disaster that is absolutely a possibility for both of them. And, and so I should caveat by saying I think it is 99% likely that it is Biden versus Trump barring that, which is un unforeseen and I don't know. Um, I think it will come down to four-ish states. Uh, it will not surprise you to learn that Arkansas is not one of them. Uh, my, my home state of Connecticut is not one of them either for the opposite reason. Um, I think it will be Arizona, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. Uh, you could add, Skip and I were talking backstage, you could, you could add Georgia in there, maybe. I'm a little bit skeptical there. You could add Nevada in there. I think Trump is probably a little bit favored in Georgia. I think Biden is favored in Nevada. Um, and that fact, I think, belies what, what, at least for some of the Democrats I talked to, seem to think like, surely... Donald Trump could never be elected again. And my answer is, you know, we're talking about 150,000 votes across those, 200,000 votes across those four states. You know, he look at the numbers. He almost won in 2020. I know the Electoral College was 306 for Biden, I think. But it's a very narrow margin. So, yeah, I think um, I would say I would put a finger on the scale for Biden, but it'd probably be a pinky finger. Um, but I absolutely think it's going to be extremely close, and, and I could see Trump winning, which I said this to Skip backstage, is, is remarkable to me, um, even as someone who spent my whole life doing this. Um, just given the 2020 election, trying to overturn it, January 6th, four indictments, 91 counts, um, found... found uh, you know, this Skip and I were talking about this walk over here. Found found this week uh, guilty of uh, drastically inflating his assets over a decades long period. I mean, any of those things would be. I was thinking this today. John McCain. I'll stop here. But John McCain. Remember, in 2015, uh, uh, Donald Trump says very early in his candidacy, "I like my uh, war heroes not captured." Remember, he said that. And like at the time, I wrote, I was like working at the Washington Post, surely this is the end. <laughs> Nailed that one. Uh, surely this is the end for Donald Trump. Uh, it was not. And so again, I think he is judged by a different standard. He is judged as a celebrity. Um, it is a different standard, and that's why I think he has a chance. I'll stop there. Thank you all so Listen, much thank for Thank you, Chris. Uh, we're going to be in the back. He's going to sign books. So uh, thank you all.